Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us tonight for Senior Planning Night for the class of 2023 at Hopewell Valley Central High School. Um, I'm going to start in just a moment, but just a couple of quick housekeeping items before we, before we do get underway. Um, we're in a webinar format. So if you have any questions throughout the program, you won't be able to ask them aloud, but I'd welcome you to ask them in the question and answer box on the bottom of your screen. Uh, there's the chat and the Q&A, but if you can use the Q&A, it'll, it'll make things a little easier for me to keep track of and field questions as we're going along. I'll do my best to answer questions as they're relevant to the conversation. And then at the end of the program, we'll have time for any unanswered questions or any additional questions that you might have. And if you have any personal questions that you'd prefer not to ask in front of the larger group tonight, feel free to contact either myself or your child school counselor uh, in the coming days. And we can have that more um, individualized personal conversation about any of your questions. <clears throat> okay. The slide goes over basically what I just said. <laughs> uh, and also a recording of this program will be distributed. Uh, there's a, a portion of parents who I think will miss tonight because it's the senior night for the girls soccer team. So first of all, I hope they do extremely well tonight. And second, if anybody has any questions who misses the program, feel free to reach out afterwards. <clears throat> I wanna start by going over a couple of terms that are gonna be very important throughout really the entire college admissions process. Um, if you attended junior parent night in the spring, they probably sound familiar. Um, and if you remember them, that's good because I must have said something memorable. Um, but two big words, simplify and ownership. Um, this college application process, of, as I imagine you've gathered by now in the fall of senior year, can be pretty, um, pretty complicated. There can be a lot of moving parts. It can be very stressful. Uh, and we do everything we can as a counseling team to alleviate that. Um, but the best thing that, that a student can do and parents can do is try to simplify that, that complicated process and try to break down what's a long-term process with a lot of moving parts into more short-term objectives, focusing on those goals and those pieces that can be completed more in the short term, more immediately. Uh, and, and with that in mind, communicate with your counselor or with your child's counselor uh, so that staying on top of things. Um, nothing's sneaking up at the last minute. You're aware of any deadlines um, and that'll certainly help in the long run. The other word is ownership. Uh, we do a lot of work as a counseling team to make sure that our students are the ones taking charge of their own college application process. They're extremely fortunate to have parents who are so interested and, and helping them along the way, but it's really important that they're the ones taking charge uh, and, and the lead in their admissions process. That's how, we, we, that's how students really find schools that are gonna be good fits for them if, if they're the ones taking the lead. Um, just to share one example, at the previous school I worked at, the most egregious example of this is a student who uh, had already submitted all of, of their applications and come to find out about, I think it was about January that they'd all been submitted through his parents' email address. Um, and it was, awkward. Uh, and, you know, I don't, I don't know if it cost the student in the long run, but it, it certainly didn't help, I think, to for a school to see an email address other than their own that their applications were attached to. So just don't like to mention that at the outset. So just to go over what's been happening in the counseling office since school started. Um, actually, we could circle back before school started. Uh, over the summer, we hosted a couple of college application workshops that hopefully a lot of you, a lot of you, or a lot of your your children attended um, in August to try to just kind of jumpstart that application process for as many of our rising seniors as possible. Uh, we had, I want to say, I forget the exact number, sixty or seventy, maybe eighty students between the two sessions who came in and worked with us in the community room, uh, and I I like to think it really gave them a leg up and made them feel more comfortable going into senior year. Um, in the past couple of weeks since school started, our, our counselors have been visiting our seniors recitation classes uh, and giving kind of group presentations, refreshers on the admissions process and explaining exactly what counselors are expecting from the students and um, kind of the nuts and bolts of the, of the process, especially as it pertains to 
their um, work in the counseling office. Right now, we have individual senior planning meetings ongoing with each student. Um, so each student is being is meeting individually with their counselor for a you know a tailored meeting to discuss post secondary plans, whether that's college or or any other path after high school, which we'll discuss more about. And then obviously our department is working hard to process all of those application documents upon student requests, transcripts, recommendation letters, et cetera, which, which we'll talk about later in the presentation. So before, the majority of tonight is gonna to focus on the, the application process for four-year colleges, but we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about all of the uh, valuable pathways that students have to choose from after graduating high school. Uh, first, we have all types of different colleges from two-year schools to four-year schools, vocational and trade schools for students who might want to go into a particular line of work um, and accelerate along that path. There's obviously the military. There's, there's directly into the workforce. And then there's the gap year, which is another really interesting option for a student following high school graduation. Um, each spring, we host a gap year webinar similar to this one. Uh, with um, Miss Holly Bull. She is a leader in the, the gap year world. Um, and she joins us each spring to um, kind of give a rundown of, of what the gap year is, um, you know, what value it might provide for individual students. We have all of our parent programs like this one posted on our counseling department website. So uh, you can find last spring's gap year presentation uh, posted right there if you'd like to review it. And then there obviously will be another gap year webinar uh, this coming spring. I mentioned four-year college and two-year college. I just wanted to speak a little bit more about two-year college, specifically Mercer County Community College, which we have right in our backyard, such a fabulous school, and kind of just explain a little bit of the value that it can provide to students. Um, the, these links you'll see throughout the program, you can't click them now in the webinar format, but when I send the slides out and the presentation out, uh, eventually you will be able to click all of the links that you see. Um, sometimes I, I feel that community college is an overlooked option, um, you know, and I think it's become especially valuable these days after the kind of financial climate that the past few years have brought. Uh, at, at, in the fall of 2022 at Mercer County, you pay about $600 for a three credit course versus, you know, thousands of dollars at some four year schools just for a single credit. When you do the math over, you know, the course of the associate's degree that you would earn at Mercer County Community College, the financial savings can be uh, pretty amazing. Um, there are a wide, wide array of associate's programs and certificate programs offered at Mercer County. There's a link there, but obviously you can just Google it and find it pretty easily yourself as well, all the, all the different programs that they offer. And Mercer County or any community college can be extremely valuable for any student. I think it's especially valuable for the student who maybe doesn't have the transcript coming out of high school that adequately represents their abilities, their potential, uh, maybe a down period through high school or didn't quite hit the ground running freshman year and the GPA isn't what it quite could be. Um, you know, community college can offer a real springboard for a student who um, might not be able to get into the type of a school out of, out of high school that they really belong at, but if they spend a year or two at a, at a community college, it can springboard them into that, you know, upper echelon of, of, of four-year schools, Ivy Leagues even, and, and some of the most, um, some of the most selective schools in the country take many, many, many students from community colleges every year. So I just wanted to go over that. If community college uh, is, is something that interests you, um, it's certainly a conversation to have with your child, with your student, and with their, um, with their counselor, if you'd like to discuss it further. One of the most important things at this point is to be getting organized, to have an idea of uh, all the deadlines that are going to be coming up in the, in the next few months. Um, and just getting a picture of, of what's coming. So the first point is to become familiar with Naviance. Hopefully that's a word that you're familiar with at this point. Every student in our school has a Naviance account. You as, as parents, you can access Naviance through your students' accounts. Our parents do not get their own accounts. 
but you're, you can use the same password and, and login credentials as the student and log in and um, have a look around. Naviance is what we sent, what we use to send all of the supporting documents to colleges. And it's where we have our students build the lists of the colleges that they're applying to, because that's how we eventually send the documents. At this point, students really should have already built the list of colleges they're thinking about. As they've been identifying schools, they, they've been told to be adding them to that list. And then when they meet with their counselor here in the, in the fall of senior year, uh, the counselor will move those schools that they're actually applying to, the ones that, they, that the student submits a transcript request form, they'll move those schools to the colleges I'm applying to list. We'll talk a little bit more about those transcript request forms, but uh, that's something that a student needs to submit one copy of for every school that they apply to. If you apply to 10 schools, you submit 10 unique transcript request forms, one for each school. And that's how we know where to send what. It's also extremely important to know all the deadlines, know our counseling office deadlines, which we'll talk about, know the actual college's application deadlines. And we have our own deadlines a couple of weeks ahead of the college deadlines so that we can make sure we have time to process all the documents. Uh, and then SAT or ACT registration deadlines. At this point in senior year, most students have probably already taken are probably finished taking the SAT and or the ACT. Uh, if not, they've probably registered for all of their SATs or ACTs, but if not, be mindful of, of all those deadlines. And then financial aid and scholarship deadlines. We'll talk a little bit more about that later in the program. We also have a financial aid night similar to this one. We have financial aid night coming up uh, on October, you know, the dates later in the slides, I believe it's the 11th, we'll, we'll, we'll fact check that later. A few, a few points on building that list of colleges. Uh, it's extremely important to build an appropriate list of schools. It's important to keep in mind admissions requirements for each school and to put together a list of reach schools, target schools, and likely schools, or, or you might hear them called safety schools, um, to put a student in the, best, in the best position possible. It's important to be setting up visits and talking with admissions representatives from each college. And it's important that the student is the one making those communications. We have throughout the fall, um, many, 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 many college admissions representatives visiting our counseling office and our students in person every, every week, every day. Most days this time of year, we have three or so admissions representatives visiting our counseling office. Uh, within Naviance, I'll, I'll explain this a little more later, but in Naviance, it shows a schedule of which colleges are visiting on which day, and students can register for those visits, and, and we'll give them a pass to come down to the counseling office and meet with those admissions representatives. Attending in-person or, or virtual campus visits, uh, heavy emphasis and preference on the in-person. In the past few years, colleges have developed a, a wide array of virtual campus visit tools and um, uh, you know, the, the virtual tools and the virtual tour guides on the website and all this impressive stuff they, that they had to come up with during COVID while campuses were closed. But now that campuses are open again, really rely on those in-person visits. That's how you get the feel for which school is the right fit and where a student's going to be happy. Um, On that, on that note, we'd like to focus on, and if this slide looks familiar, it's because I copied it from our junior parent night in the spring, uh, but it's still extremely, extreme, uh, extremely relevant. Uh, we wanna make sure that we're focusing on the best fit school, not just getting into the best school or the, the most impressive school or, or what, what have you. Um, we can really increase the chance that a student's gonna be happy and that they're gonna, that they're gonna matriculate and be retained at that college and, and not, not want to transfer, not want to go somewhere else. Um, you know, these days, most colleges are between 15 and 40% of all newly enrolled undergraduates are via transfer. So it's a really significant portion of students who are, you know, not sticking at the first school that they go to and eventually looking for a different one to attend. And I think, I think a lot of that comes back to students getting enamored with trying to go to the most uh, prestigious school or the most impressive school rather than the one where they belong or where they where they feel the most comfortable. Again, avoid that obsession with with the rankings and the brand names and make sure that we're focusing on 
the school that you visit and you say, man, this is where I want to go. I feel so comfortable here. Um, and that's where the, the in-person visits are, you know, the value just can't be overstated. A couple of terms I, I mentioned before, but uh, just explain a little bit more reach target and likely schools. A reach school is, is one that, um, you know, is, you know, it's pretty self-explanatory, but a school where the GPA, the, the test scores, the numbers are significantly higher than, than the student. Uh, you apply to a REACH school understanding that the chances are not extremely high that you're going to be accepted, but you want to give it a shot nonetheless. Certain schools like Ivy League schools are, are REACHs for every single applicant, even if, you know, a top, top student, their GPA and their SAT uh, or ACT score might look like it's in line with the numbers that those colleges, those Ivy League schools publish. Um, but, you know, unfortunately, every year, thousands and thousands and thousands of kids don't get into Ivy League schools who have nearly perfect GPAs and, and um, you know, perfect testing scores. So, you know, sometimes those numbers can be a little bit misleading. Target schools would be ones where a school is a good match based on the admission standards, uh, where you think you, you can get in, you, you're confident you're going to get in, but it's not a sure thing and it's not a long shot. Uh, and then a likely school or a safety school is, is one where a student far exceeds the, the admission standards. Uh, every student should apply to at least one safety school. I think every student should apply to at least two safety schools so that they have a choice. So they're not, you know, if it comes to it, stuck with the one safety school that they chose to apply to. Um, so those are just a few of the key terms that we're going to be using throughout the process. There was a, a question in the Q&A, do we have to request transcripts for schools that only need SRAR links? Uh, it's, a good, it's a really good question. If you're not familiar with SRAR, that means self-reported academic record. Um, a lot of colleges these days are not even requiring uh, an, a, an official transcript to be sent from the high school uh, when, when the application is submitted. They actually let students fill in all of their um, grades and report their own grades um, with the, um, when they apply. It's still best to submit a form even for those schools. Um, first of all, so that your counselor knows when you're applying and, and where you've applied. Um, so that's, that's, that is the best practice. So in terms of we talked about, I'm sorry, go backwards for a second. We talked about reach, target, and safety schools and kind of gauging your chances with, with each school. Um, we have tool, a tool in Naviance called Scattergrams, which are probably the most valuable tool to, to categorize schools in, in that way. You'll see a, a chart here for Virginia Polytechnic Institute State University, otherwise known as Virginia Tech. You might have guessed that's my alma mater. Um, and I... You know, so I chose to use it on this slide. But you'll see that these charts really map out um, and give a good idea of a student's chances for acceptance um, at a given school. This, the charts show students who were accepted in greens, who were um, rejected in red. And if they're in purple, it means that they were waitlisted. And then we don't know, it wasn't reported whether or not they eventually got in. Um, so you'll see our students have done really well at Virginia Tech in recent years. This, these, these charts only show hope, hope well students, and they only show students in, in the previous few years. Um, as, a, as a former Hopewell Valley High School student graduate and a former Virginia Tech graduate, uh, I love to see that so many students are still heading down to Blacksburg from Hopewell. Um, but you'll see that the, the charts show dotted lines for the average GPA of accepted students for each college and, and the dotted line for the average test score of, of accepted students. And, and they can give you a good general sense whether you, they fit in, whether they would be a safety school, a target school, or a reach school for a given student. Obviously, some schools will have a lot more data points. Like if you look at Rutgers chart in Naviance or TCNJ or Penn State, they're going to have even more data points. Um, versus some schools that might only have a few. And if it's a school, let's say you're applying to New Mexico or something real far away, these charts aren't going to be as valuable because there won't be as many data points. But for schools close by to here, 
that we have a lot of applicants to, they can provide some really good data. Kind of segues into choosing a major. One of the things those charts doesn't show is, is what major each student applied for, um, each data point on those charts. And sometimes that can explain why a student up here didn't get into a given school and a student down here did get into that school. It can be because up here applied for a pre-med track or a real competitive engineering program. And then the student who was down lower applied undecided or, or to a less rigorous program. Um, so the chosen major can have a really significant impact on an admissions decision. Some schools like Rutgers, for example, allows you to choose multiple majors on, during the application. Rutgers allows you to choose three different majors and then you, you can receive three unique admissions decisions, uh, one for each major that you've chosen. Um, and, and there's nothing wrong with applying undecided. If a student doesn't know what they wanna go into at this point, you're not, you're not forced to, um, to choose something. You can go undecided, you can choose a more broad major uh, line of study. Um, and you know, sometimes you, <clears throat> there might be an opportunity to explain why, or they might wanna know why you chose the, the program or the major that you did. And you know, if you were undecided, you can explain something along these lines here that, that you have different passions that you wanna explore and that you're excited for this college because it allows the opportunity to explore these different options before committing to a specific path. Um, don't say I'm going undecided because I have no idea what I want to do with my life, uh, right? You want to phrase it a little more, highlight it a little more positively. There are some majors, usually the more competitive ones at some schools that you have to enter as a freshman. You can't transfer into later on down the line. So if you do think about going in undecided, um, just make sure that that's not the case for for a major that you might be interested in eventually transferring into. Um, just something to keep in mind at this point in the process. I mentioned before the, 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 the um, admissions reps who are visiting Hopewell. And there's a screenshot at the bottom of Naviance in the Naviance account where you can, um, where you can view those lists of, of which schools are visiting when. Um, between now and the middle of November, we have several colleges visiting every single school day. So there's plenty of opportunities to meet with admissions representatives. Um, students need to make sure that they register for those sessions ahead of time through Naviance. Each morning in the morning announcements, Ms. Riley also announces verbally which schools are visiting that day. Um, and then a student can stop into the counseling office to receive a pass and they show their teacher that pass, and then they're, 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 they, they ask their teacher uh, for permission to go down to the counseling office and meet with that, that admissions representative. These admissions, these meetings are super valuable. Um, you know, it's a chance for students to network with the admissions representatives from, from schools they're interested in, and often these admissions reps are the same people who will be in that war room making decisions uh, later on in the process on who gets accepted and who doesn't. Uh, it might not have a huge impact, but it could. A, an admissions rep could remember your name from a, a meeting at Hopewell Valley Central High School and, oh, I remember that student. They asked a really informed question and they followed up with an email the next day and they built that relationship. Um, things like that can go a really long way, especially to some schools that value what they call demonstrated interest more than others. Um, if they have these types of things on file and they, you've, they've become familiar with you throughout the application process, it's, it, it certainly can't hurt. <clears throat> I'm just going into, I'm just looking at the Q&A, there's a couple of questions. Are recommendation letters, letters invited and submitted through Common App? Um, no, they're submitted through Naviance. We use Naviance for our uh, recommendation letters because that's the system that we use to, um, to send all of our documents. That's something that we go over a lot with our students. Um, the counselors did that in their recitation visits in the past few weeks, and they talk about that with each individual senior. Um, they need to add their teachers who are going to be writing their letters within their Naviance account. And then that sends the teacher a request and, it, and, it, and then the teacher uploads their letter to Naviance. 
and, and sends directly to the colleges through Naviance. So that's how we do that, not, not through Common App. Um, and what's the best way to find out if a college is flexible to transfer undecided students to a particular major in the future? It's a pretty specific question. So it's probably not something uh, that's gonna be found on the website. Uh, if, it's, if it's something you're considering, it's, it's, really, it's really a question to ask directly to an admissions representative for a particular school. I, I would check the website first and see if there's any information about that. Um, but it's, it's probably the type of question that would need to be directed, um, be asked directly to the college, to the admissions rep. Let's see. Should you do an interview if a college offers them? What are the benefits and risks? How should the student prepare? Um, that's a pretty loaded question, and we could talk for quite a while about just that, about preparing for an admissions interview. Um, I think that that I think that in almost every case, it's a good idea if a, if a college offers an interview, and not that many colleges. A lot of colleges don't offer admissions interviews, but if they do offer one, it probably means that they value it, and that a student could do themselves a lot of favors by by doing well in one. Um, in terms of preparing for an interview, like I said, there's a lot there. Uh, I would recommend um, either you or your, 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 your child um, talking to their counselor about that and, and having you know, a further conversation about that. Uh, and then there's a question, this is a really good question. Do we need to ask our teachers for letters in person or do we request it through Naviance? You will formally request it through Naviance but it's definitely best to ask in person first. Um, you want it to be personal. You want it to be personable. Um, and you know, you're really asking the teacher to do a favor for you here and to you know, talk about the relationship that you have with them. And I think it's best for that relationship if you go to the teacher in person and you know, explain why you chose them to write a recommendation letter. You know, I think we, I really uh, valued my time in your class and I think you know me really well. And, I think it's just a conversation that's more appropriate to have in person. And then you could certainly follow up with an email and say, thank you for agreeing to write my letter. Uh, I'm putting the requests in through Naviance. Um, so, so I think it's both. It's, it's best to have to initiate it with a conversation in person. And then you will actually put the request in through Naviance so that the teacher has it on their account that they need to submit your letter. And then there's a, this is a great question. When the colleges come to Hopewell, are the meetings one-on-one -on -one or are there several students in the room at the same time with the representative? Uh, sometimes it's one-on-one, -on -one, but that's, that's, only if only one, that's if only one student signed up for the meeting. Uh, they are typically group meetings, especially for schools that, um, that have more interest from students. Um, you know, sometimes for a, a, real, a real popular school where we have a lot of applicants, uh, we can't even, we don't even do it in our counseling conference room. We might have to do it in the community room or in a larger space if there's a lot of students. Um, so it really depends on the college. Uh, there's a question that a teacher asked my child for an email and information on which schools. So how do they then ask through Naviance for recommendations? Um, so it, it's, there's a, a mix of communication in person, um, you know, and answering any questions the, the teacher has. Teachers might ask a student for a resume or for, for certain information to help them write the best letter that they can. Um, but then there's also a formal process in Naviance where you click on, I believe you click colleges on the top, and then you click letters of recommendation. And then there's a tool where you can select the teachers from a drop down menu and pick exactly which teacher you'd like to write your letter uh, for your colleges. And then once you do that in the teacher's account, it shows them a list of the colleges your the students applying to and, and where they need to um, submit their letters. Who are the best folks to review college essays? Um, I think I often suggest uh, an English teacher and I suggest counselors. Uh, there certainly could be other people, other valuable people to, to read them, other teachers or, you know, um, other people who a student might know who, who might be 
might be able to help. Um, but my most common suggestions are English teacher and counselor. And you know, the English teacher can help with you know more of the nuts and bolts and the structure and the the actual like um, the writing of the essay. And then you know the counselor can can also help with like the overall message and and how you know how how valuable they think the 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 response the essay is um, for the application. We also each year host a college essay night uh, each spring. So um, we hosted one this past spring for the class of 2023 on writing the college essay. Again, that that recording is posted on our counseling website under parent presentations. And you can certainly review that for even more insight about the writing of the essay uh, and, and the different things to look for in it. So that's all the questions I see for now. So we'll get back to the, back to the slides. <clears throat> so we'll talk about a few different deadline types. I don't wanna go into too, too much detail here, but the most common terms you'll see in terms of deadlines um, are the, the early action deadlines, the early decision deadlines. Uh, and then on the next slide, we'll talk about regular decision. Um, but it's, a, it's an important distinction between, between, between early action and early decision. Early action is a non-binding option where you can apply to as many schools, any schools that offer it at an earlier date, usually between middle of October and early December are when most early action dates tend to fall. Again, not every school is gonna offer early action, not every school is gonna offer early decision, but if they offer early action, it's non-binding and you can apply to as many schools through early action as you want to. Early decision on the other hand is binding. It's a much more serious decision to apply early decision. It means that you found your dream school it means there's no doubt in your mind that even if you got accepted to every single school you applied to, you'd want to go to that one. No doubt. Nothing could change your mind. And the reason you have to be that certain is because once you are accepted to a school through early decision, you have to go there. You sign a legal document when you apply to a school early decision. A parent has to sign it and the counselor has to sign it, certifying that the, the applicant understands and the family understands that um, they, are, they are bound to attend the, the institution if they get accepted. Um, I've had students in the past apply early decision for the wrong reasons. They apply early decision because they see that the acceptance rates through early decision are a little bit higher than through early action or regular decision. Um, while that's true and it can increase your chances a bit to apply early decision because the school knows they have you if they, if they accept you, um, you can really put yourself in a tricky situation if you apply early decision to a school that's not truly a dream school. Um, you know, I've had students accepted early decision and, and initially it's a celebration and usually it's a pretty prestigious school that you've gotten into, but then maybe in you know, January, December or January after that decision, you find out about this other school or, or you, you start you know, having second thoughts and uh, thinking another school might be a better fit. If you've been accepted through early decision at that point, you, you don't have any, you don't really have any recourse. Um, so on the other hand, early action is, is, is a more attractive option where you can apply to as many schools as you want and there's no binding nature to the agreement. The real advantage of applying early action is that you usually get a decision back from the school uh, before or around the holiday break. And what a relief that can be to, to already have an acceptance or more than one acceptance um, that early on in the process. It can just take so much weight off of the student's shoulders during what can be such a stressful time. So I also mentioned um, uh, regular decision, which is where the deadline is later in the, the winter, usually January or February. Uh, and then you learn of an admissions decision in March or April. Um, some schools don't offer the early admissions dates, so you, you might have to apply regular admission. Uh, another reason to wait for early admission might be if you're not quite ready to apply yet. Um, maybe, maybe you just aren't ready by those early application dates, or maybe um, you had a rough junior year. Uh, grades weren't really up to par, and you want to have a really good first semester of senior year under your belt before applying so that the colleges can see that you're back on an upward trajectory. 
Uh, in that case, you might wait and apply regular decision so that a school will see your, your mid-year report with your semester one grades before, before they make a decision because you wouldn't want them to make base their decision on a poor junior year on your transcript. Another common one is rolling admission. Rolling admission basically means there's no set deadline and you can apply anytime that you'd like. Um, and colleges can make a decision anytime that they'd like. If that's the case, if you're applying to a rolling admission school, the, early you can, the earlier you can apply, the better. Um, the longer you wait in the admissions process, colleges are gonna start filling up more and more seats if they're rolling. And then when they have fewer seats left, they're going to be start to become more and more selective. So if you can get those applications in earlier on, it can certainly only help. Uh, there's a question, how are colleges chosen for the visits? Um, they, the colleges sign up through, um, through Naviance. They register for, uh, we don't select them, colleges Colleges sign up to, to present at Hopewell on their own. Um, they go into their own system where they can reserve a date and a time uh, in our database, and then they're automatically added. So any college that wants to come visit Hopewell is, is more than welcome to. Uh, if there's a school that, that you're interested in that's not visiting, um, I would suggest reaching out directly to the admissions representative for New Jersey from that school. Uh, you can usually find, you can always find that information on a college's admissions website. If you, um, usually there's some sort of link, or if you just Google University of Delaware admissions representatives, it'll bring you to the page where it lists, you know, by state, who the person is that, that visits and, and covers those areas, and then reach out to that person via email, asking any questions you might have. Um, you can even ask them to set up a Zoom call or to set up some type of a meeting like that. And, and again, that's another way to, um, to network with those admissions folks. Um, so this is an excellent question. It's actually segueing into my next point. If a student doesn't get accepted through early action, do they get put in the regular, regular application pool? Yes, that's, that's exactly what happens um, if they get deferred. So when you apply early action, there are three possible outcomes, essentially. You can be accepted, which is wonderful, obviously, best case scenario. You can be rejected, or you can be deferred. Deferred means we're not quite ready to decide yet, so we're going to move you to the regular decision pool. And then your application gets reviewed, um, just as if you'd applied regular decision in the first place. Now, if they don't defer you and they reject you in early action, it I'm pretty confident in saying that that means you would have gotten rejected in regular decision anyway. If not, they would have just deferred you. If they, you know, if, if, if they weren't sure if they were gonna accept you or not, they defer you. And if, they're, um, if they don't defer you, that means that they were confident you weren't gonna be accepted in regular decision anyway. Uh, and that's why I see it as a no loss situation to apply early action. It does nothing but speed up the process. You can get an acceptance earlier, and while it stinks, you can get a rejection earlier, but at least then you have closure a little bit earlier on in the process. You're not strung along waiting until February or March to get an admissions decision. Um, so yeah, the, the, the short answer was yes, but that was the long-winded version. Okay. So question, could, could regular decision be better because they will see senior grades? Um, yes. Absolutely. Um, you know, that's one of the advantages of waiting until the regular decision deadline is because uh, then you do get first marking period and second marking period under your belt of senior year. Um, and, and that's especially valuable if junior year maybe wasn't wasn't quite your best. If you if you thought you could have done better and you don't want a college to judge you based on your junior year grades, then wait until regular decision you know, really go hard in the classroom for the first semester of senior year, put some really impressive grades on, on your transcript and then apply um, and, and colleges will see that and that'll go a really, really long way because they colleges want to accept students who are on an upward trajectory. So if you can do anything to display that, it'll really help. <clears throat> okay. 
for early action November 1st, when do students request transcripts? Um, we'll, we'll get to those deadlines a little bit later on in the presentation. Um, uh, will, will first quarter grades of 12th grade show if applying in December? Um, so not necessarily, but what a student can always do is email a copy of their first marking period report card to, to an admissions representative. If they know who their admissions officer is, um, that some applications will offer the opportunity to upload um, updated documents. So you can do that if the application supports it. Uh, in other cases, you could email a copy of a report card um, directly to, to the admissions office so that they could add it to your admissions file um, in time to be considered along with the application. If my child has already decided to apply early decision to one school, should we still go forward with other applications or should we wait until the decision in December? I would, I would move forward with those other applications. Um, it'll just make things, if and I, and I hope they do get accepted to that school, but um, if they don't, then at least you'll be a little bit more ahead of the game and, and you know, won't have to scramble as much to get those, that next round of applications in. Um, so I, I would suggest still submitting those other applications or at least being, being ready to click submit um, so that you don't have to scramble at the last minute. Some colleges that are, another question, some colleges that are test optional say they lean on reference letters and prefer core subjects or, and prefer core subjects or counselors for the recommendation letters. Um, um, so there's a question, since my, so this alludes to a counselor who has just left on Hopewell High School, um, but you can still rely on the interim counselor who's here in their place to write a recommendation letter. In fact, when colleges list how many recommendation letters they, re they require, uh, that's for teacher recommendation letters. The counselor recommendation letter is completely separate. And if they're asking for recommendation letters, it's assumed that you're gonna submit a counselor letter and that, that number of teacher letters that they're requesting. Um, and even though we did just have a counselor leave our team, um, we have an interim counselor, Mr. DeVito in, in their place, and he's more than prepared to write those recommendation letters for those students. It does increase the value of those, um, those brag sheets. That, that each student has been instructed to fill out. Um, all counselors ask students to complete brag sheets to fill them in on, on everything they've done throughout high school, especially the things that the counselor might not be aware of. Um, and when you have a new counselor, whether it's this situation or another one, you know, there's, there's students all over the country with new counselors right now applying to colleges. Those brag sheets are really what help the counselor um, learn about the student and prepare to write the best recommendation letter possible, in addition to their meetings with the students and getting to know them. Um, but that's a very good question. Does early action require you to make a decision earlier? No, it does not. If you're accepted through early action, you still have until, um, until the spring to, to decide to make a decision and to commit. Typically, May 1st is kind of denoted as the, the national college um, decision day when, when students make decisions on their applications. And that's whether they were accepted in early action or, or in regular decision. Okay. <clears throat> so I, this kind of came up through one of the questions and I talked about deferral. Um, I do, I, I do want to also highlight, though, there's two different terms that sometimes get confused, deferral and waitlist. Deferral, like we said, is when you've applied early and you get moved to the regular decision pool. Waitlist is when you've applied um, through regular decision or you were maybe deferred to regular decision. And now the college has gone through all of their regular decision decisions. Um, they've sent out all their acceptances. They don't have any more room in their class to offer any more acceptances. At that point, that's when they start putting students on a wait list. So a deferral or being deferred is much better than being put on a wait list. Deferral means that you're still in the game. You've just been moved from early action to regular decision. Whereas wait list means we're done. You're on the outside looking in. 
Uh, and if, if enough students tell us that they don't want to come here, you know, enough students who were accepted turn down their offer of acceptance, then we might have room for some students who are on the wait list. So in a nutshell, uh, deferral is, is much better than wait list. So we'll talk a little bit about the pandemic's effect on the process, although I think it's, it's decreasing a little bit compared to you know, the past couple of application um, classes. Um, um, so a lot of factors here you see on the screen have remained the same. A couple of, you know, some things have changed. Changed. The one largest thing that's changed is the number of test optional schools. We're up to now, I think it's now over 800 schools across the country that are, um, that have test optional policies. Um, and, you know, that's, that, that's a number that started, you know, colleges started going test optional for the class of 2020, the class of 2021 because those students just didn't have the opportunity to take the SAT as many times as they, they would have without the, the pandemic having canceled everything. Um, but I think over the course of the last few years, a lot of colleges realized, well, maybe, maybe we don't really need test scores as much as we thought. You know, maybe we can make really good solid admissions decisions based on uh, recommendation letters and, and students' essays and uh, everything else that we can learn about students uh, beyond those test scores. So. Um, and, you know, the number really hasn't decreased. It's, it's become larger, the number of schools that are, that are still test optional. You know, students' activities might have been disrupted for our seniors now. It would have been a little earlier on in high school, but colleges will understand that if there are some gaps in the extracurriculars, especially volunteer work where, you know, you really couldn't volunteer a lot of places at the height of the pandemic. Um, and, and campuses were obviously closed for in-person visits in previous years. I mentioned earlier how camp colleges have come up with some really robust virtual visiting options like the online tours and the um, online info sessions and all that stuff. Uh, and while it's great and it, and it helped a lot of students, especially during the pandemic when campuses were closed, um, you know, I think now we, we need to get back to, to relying on those in-person campus visits. Um, because like I said before, not to be redundant, that's how you really learn the most about the colleges. <clears throat> For more information about test optional schools, ones that don't require the SAT or the, or the ACT, uh, the, the website is fairtest.org. For a long time, fairtest.org has been tracking the colleges across the country that don't require these, these entrance exams. Um, and, and obviously the number has skyrocketed in the past few years because of the pandemic. So if a school is test optional, how do I decide whether I'm gonna test or whether I'm gonna submit my scores? Um, my general answer is test, uh, you know, take the test and just see how you do. If your scores aren't up to snuff or they aren't like near the average for the school that you wanna to apply to, then you don't need to submit them, um, but it, it can't hurt to, to take the exams and to um, see, see where you fall. Um, now, there might be some students who just know like test taking is the weakness. Like it's, it's, not, gonna go, it's not gonna be real impressive. Um, you know, from taking the PSAT and taking other tests in school and practice exams, you might just know that, that it's not for you, you know, based on your learning style or based on the way that you perform. And, if that's the case, then, then maybe don't test. But I think, especially for seniors who we're talking to now, we're kind of beyond that point. You've already taken these tests. If you're going to, it's really a question of, do I report the scores to the schools or not? Uh, and that's a conversation to have with your counselor. Um, and you really just wanna look at the average test scores for each school and see how yours compare. And if you're close to those, their average scores or you're above their average scores, then you submit them. But if you're, you know, if you're if you're really below their their scores, then then there's no reason to submit them, assuming the school is test optional. Again, these are the websites for each test: collegeboard.org and actstudent.org. Um, if you are submitting test scores to schools, you do it directly through those websites. Um, some colleges on the application might allow you to, to self-report your test scores, but eventually they're going to want, especially if you decide to go to a school, they're going to want your official score report. 
and you can only provide them your official score report by logging into your account on one of those websites, selecting which college you want to send your score to and sending the scores. And when you send them, you get to choose which test dates you want to send. Aside from a very select few schools that require you to submit all of your scores, um, most schools will let you pick which of the test scores you want to submit. So if you did have one really bad one, maybe the first time you took it was really low, you don't need to send that. You can just send the scores that you're more happy with. I kind of jumped ahead and spoke about what, what's on this slide here. <clears throat> it's important not to wait till the last minute. You might think that if you go on College Board and, and click Submit My August SAT Score, it just like automatically like drops into the college's inbox like magic, but it doesn't. It takes College Board quite some time to process their documents. Um, so it's best to send those score reports weeks ahead of any deadlines. Um, they do offer a rushed score report for an additional fee if you're kind of backed up against the wall. But in general, um, just submit the scores earlier rather than later and, and you won't have anything to worry about. You do not have to coincide your sending of scores with your submission of the application. You can, you can go in and send your scores even before you apply and it's perfectly fine. Um, the, the, the files and documents will all marry together out in cyberspace. Um, once, you're, once, you, once you apply to the school, they'll all then populate into your admissions file with the school. So you don't have to worry about submitting everything like at the same time or one thing before the other, just submit them. <clears throat> okay. Just a couple of different websites. There's also the coalition um, coalition application that you might see or you might come across. It's much less common than, than the common app as the name suggests, um, but it's another application that started several years ago um, that, that a number of schools use. Um, and then there also are school specific applications. Some schools don't take common app, don't take coalition, and you'll just have to go to their website and fill out their separate application on their website. So those are the three different um, three different places you might be applying. Uh, an important note there, make sure that you're using a, a personal email address when you apply and a school appropriate one. Both of those points are very important. Um, you know, you might have a student might have a more like childish email address from years past. You want to make sure when you're applying to college, it's it should just be like first name, last name at Gmail or, you know, something more professional along those lines. It's best not to use your school email address. Uh, first of all, um, the main reason is because let's say, you know, let's say you're creating a common app account. Con if you ever do decide to transfer down the line, you're going to need to use common app again for those, those transfer applications. And if you created your common app account with your school email address, it, it'll be dead at that point. You won't be able to access it because your school email account will be deactivated. But if you used your Gmail account or your other personal email account, then it'll still be active and you'll be able to log right back in and pick up where you left off in submitting those, um, those other applications. Uh, there's one question, how can we find the 2022-23 school profile for HVCHS? Uh, you don't really need to find that. That's something that we submit uh, through Naviance along with all the supporting documents. We submit the transcript, um, recommendation letters, school profile, that's, uh, that's something that we take care of in the counseling office. Let's see. So we've talked a little bit about Common App throughout the program. Common App is accepted by over 900 colleges throughout the country, even more than that now. Um, and we use it in conjunction with Naviance. There's a, a process, um, you know, counselors have gone through this process with students a number of times now. We did it during those recitation visits. We did it over the summer in those application workshops. Um, but there's a process to match the Naviance account with the Common App account so that they're speaking to each other. And what's done in Common App is then reflected in Naviance and, and vice versa. Um, so that's an important process to take care of. And then that allows us to send all those supporting documents through the Common App, transcripts, recommendation letters, um, teacher evaluation forms, school reports, media reports, 
um, and the school profile, which was alluded to in, in one of those questions. Also the mid-year report. Every student, or I'm sorry, every school that a student applies to will automatically receive that student's mid-year report from our office at the end of the second marking period. Um, you may get emails from colleges uh, through the winter, like make sure your high school sends your mid-year report, uh, make sure to send your mid-year report, et cetera. Um, just know that we automatically send those mid-year reports um, and there's nothing a student needs to do in order to request it. If they requested the initial transcript and we sent the initial transcript, then the mid-year grades will automatically be sent. <clears throat> Uh, there's a question, how do you link Naviance to Common App if not using school email address? Um, that's, it, it doesn't require a school email address. When you, um, um, when you follow the instructions to match Naviance and Common App, it asks, in Naviance, it'll ask you to type in the email address that you used for Common App. And you just type in whatever email address that was, Gmail or whatever it was, um, and then the, the two platforms link together. The linking process between Naviance and Common App, is it done in Naviance or is it Common App? It's done in both actually. Um, you'll start the process in Common App by signing the FERPA waiver um, and by you know, clicking through those, those instructions and then, and then it'll tell you to return to Naviance. And when you go back into Naviance, it'll ask you to click the match button and to type in the email address you used for Common App and then it, it links the two together. So it's kind of a, a back and forth between the, two, uh, between the two sites. It's a process that our students should be familiar with by now and they should have already completed by now. So that's a good question to ask a student, <coughs> excuse me, if they've already done that. And if they haven't done it, they should um, talk to their counselor and make sure that they do it ASAP. Are mid-year grades automatically sent even if not using Common App? Yes, if we, if we have sent um, initial grades, then we automatically send mid-year grades. Do you do the linking while Common App is still in process? You do the linking um, beforehand. You do, you, you do that linking um, initially uh, before submitting before submitting anything through Common App. Um, again, with the, the specifics of linking Common App and Naviance, um, if a student's not clear on how to do that, they should meet with their counselor and the counselor will be able to walk them through it uh, pretty quickly. Oops. Um, so we talked a little bit about recommendations before. Um, uh, most schools require but lots of schools require two academic teacher recommendations. Um, so as a general rule of thumb, each, each student should ask at least two teachers to write recommendations for them. And you don't wanna be last minute about it. You wanna give teachers the plenty of time, at least several weeks to write those letters um, so that they can write the best letter possible. Um, when I was a counselor and I was writing rec letters, they took hours and hours for me to write. It was a really important process to me it meant a lot to me writing this letter, kind of summarizing the four years I'd worked with each student, uh, and, and it wasn't something that I could rush. So, you know, I really encourage you to give everybody as much lead time um, uh, ahead of deadlines so that they can put that necessary attention into writing those letters. <clears throat> So I mentioned before, um, the senior transcript, the release authorization um, is one piece that needs to be submitted to the counseling office. Uh, and then the senior transcript request forms. <coughs> Excuse me. Those request forms are Google documents, um, Google forms, I should say. And one of those forms will be submitted for each school that a student is applying to. If you're applying to 10 schools, you fill out 10 forms. If you're applying to five schools, five forms. And you don't have to give them all at once, right? If you have a batch of five schools right now that you wanna put through that you know you're applying to, that's fine. You can come back a few weeks later with the, with the additional ones, just making sure that you get them in in plenty of time ahead of any deadlines. 
um, brag sheets. I, I mentioned them before, but it's a really important piece to help the counselor write the best recommendation letter possible for each student. There are student brag sheets and there are parent brag sheets and they are found within the student's Naviance account under About Me and then My Surveys. That's where you'll find them. So I really uh, encourage you to take those forms seriously, to think about, um, think about what, the, what you've done, especially that your counselor is not aware of, right? There might be things, especially if you have a strong relationship with your counselor, like, oh, they, they know that, they know everything about that. But then if there's maybe some volunteer work you did over the summer um, or, you know, something that you've done that, that was more off the radar that your counselor is not aware of at all, that's the really important stuff to make sure that you're detailing in those um, on those brag sheets. There was a question earlier about those um, transcript request deadlines, and we want them in plenty of time ahead of your, your application deadlines. Um, just to make sure that there's going to be no, no last minute surprises, to make sure everything can be in in plenty of time. If you have early action or early decision deadlines of November 1st or November 15th, we ask that you submit those transcript request forms by October 8th. Okay. If you have regular decision deadlines of January 1st or January 15th, we ask that you submit them before the Thanksgiving break. Okay, an important point about those January 1st or January 15th deadlines, don't leave anything to the last minute, especially with those deadlines, because obviously our school is closed for the entire holiday break from, Jan from December what, 23rd through the new year. And the colleges are also closed for, for that same period of time. So make sure that if you have any questions about the application process or what's required or, or submissions or anything, Get those questions answered before, well before the holiday break, because it stinks if you have a January 1st deadline and all of a sudden it's December 29th and you have these questions and, and there's nobody in the high school counseling office, there's nobody in the college admissions office because they're all closed. Again, so make sure you get any of those, those um, concerns taken care of well ahead of the holiday break. <laughs> Uh, a question, a good question. Can you request to send transcripts for regular decision applications before the early decision deadline? Yes, absolutely. That's, that's the best case scenario. There's never any need to wait longer, okay? If you know you're applying to a certain school, just submit the form. There's, there's no need to wait to submit the form. Um, once you meet with your counselor, um, just submit a form for each school that you know you're gonna be applying to. Very good question. So a couple of words about financial aid. Um, two of the big terms that you're going to see are FAFSA, which is the free application for federal student aid. Um, that's applying for money through the federal government. The application for FAFSA opens on October 1st. Uh, we'll talk a little bit of, in a few minutes about uh, our financial aid night, but we hold financial aid night on October uh, 11th so, so that it's right after that application opens. You know, you get into the FAFSA, see what questions you have, get your feet wet with it a little bit. And then by the time we have our financial aid night, you'll, you'll, you'll kind of have some questions in mind and, and, and there'll be a, a more useful time for that program. And then the CSS profile um, is another um, another way to apply for, um, for financial support. It's the college scholarship search and it's um, supported through the college board. Um, and you see a little quote there, private colleges and universities use the CSS profile to determine eligibility for institutional awards and grants. FAFSA determines eligibility for federal financial aid programs. So that's essentially the difference. CSS profile is applying for money through the school FAFSA is applying for money through the federal government and money that's awarded through the federal government would be good no matter which school you ended up deciding to go to. So that's the, that's essentially the, the difference between the two. A couple of really useful, um, 
resources here. Uh, the first is HISA. HISA is the Higher Education Student Assistance Authority through um, New Jersey. And it's they're, they're experts in the field. Um, when we do our financial aid night on October 11th, it's HISA who provides us with the, the, the professional who comes and gives that talk on financial aid. Uh, and, and for our financial aid night on October 11th, um, just like last year, we're going to be joined by Wilbert Kassane. He's the director of financial aid at the College of New Jersey. Um, so he lives and breathes financial aid. It's what he does. Um, and, you know, we're super excited to have him join us for, for that program um, on October 11th. And then a couple other websites, fastweb.com, capex.com are, are good places to learn about scholarship, uh, scholarships and, and, and things like that. The NCAA, NCAA Eligibility Center um, is important if a student is considering playing a Division I or II sport in college. If you're not considering playing a Division I or II sport in college, nothing to do, don't worry about it. Uh, if you're looking to play Division Three in college, nothing to do. You don't have to meet any of these requirements. You don't have to do anything. Um, but if you're looking to play a Division One or Two school or Two um, sport, you want to make sure that you've registered with the Eligibility Center and that you've talked to your counselor about it and that they're aware so that they can make sure that you do everything needed in order to qualify to play sports when you arrive at, on your college campus. So moving forward, we have financial aid night on October 11th, which I've spoken about a few times. When these slides go out, there will be a link there you can click to register for the event. I'll be sending out a, another email invitation to register for the event, um, but you can just put that on your calendar for October 11th. November 7th, really excited to host another program. Uh, it's called Happy Healthy, Almost Stress-Free College Planning. Uh, we were contacted by um, a New York Times bestselling author who uh, it does a lot of work in the area, uh, in the field, and is going to uh, invite our community to be part of this uh, webinar that he's putting on. Uh, and I think it's just so, so important to talk about. Um, you know, I tried to highlight a little bit tonight how to alleviate some of the stress that can be caused throughout the application process, but you know, that's, that's certainly worthy of its own evening, of its own conversation. Um, so we're going to do that on November 7th. More details will come regarding that webinar. Um, but again, I'm really, really excited for, for that program. Um, you know, as, as we discuss such, a, such an important topic. I think it'll be good timing too. It's a little bit later on in the process. Um, so, you know, students may have clicked submit on their applications by then. And sometimes once you click submit is when that next layer of anxiety or that next level of that next layer of um, stress comes because I've done my part now. Now I've submitted and now I do what I just wait for other people to judge me and decide where I get in and where I don't. Sometimes, you know, unfortunately, that can that can be just as stressful as putting together the application and, and get in, getting everything in on time. Uh, working on putting together a panel discussion in in the spring, the late winter or early spring of uh, recent HVCHS graduates to come back and speak on a panel and answer questions about their experiences through freshman uh, or sophomore year of college. Uh, it's a program that we did at the previous school I worked at and I'm really excited to um, put it into place here at Hopewell. I, I think we talk a lot about the application process and how to get into schools, how to apply to schools, but we don't talk as much about how to be successful at college once you go there, um, not just academically, but with the social pieces and everything else that comes along with moving away and going to college. So working on putting that uh, program together for the spring. Um, and then like we talked about earlier, just those, those specific deadlines and making sure that the transcript request forms get in uh, and making sure that you sign up for any of those college admissions reps who might be visiting um, Hopewell Valley because those are such valuable opportunities. A few final thoughts. Uh, we've talked about a lot of this already, so I won't be too redundant, but, but let's be realistic and let's be positive. You know, everybody's gonna end up at a college where they belong and where they're gonna have a really good experience eventually. Um, as we're going through the process, we wanna be realistic though about the schools that we're applying to 
the list of colleges that we're putting together, making sure that it's a healthy mix of the REACH schools. There's nothing wrong with REACH schools, but we can't apply to just REACH schools. So we need to have REACH schools, target schools, and safety schools. Um, stay organized throughout the process. Stay on top of all those deadlines. Um, don't wait till the last minute. Seek out help. We're here for you in the counseling office. Your counselor is there for you. If they're not there for you on a given day, I, I, I most likely will be there. Somebody will be in the office who can support you and you can always reach out to us if we're not in the office at that moment. Um, and there's a path for every student, whether it's college or not. Four-year college isn't for every single student, especially not immediately out of high school. So, so we wanna think about that too. Let's not just assume that four-year college is the correct path for everybody just because that's what society says is supposed to be the right path for everybody. Let's consider all the paths, um, whether it's four-year college, two-year college, um, gap year, employment, uh, whatever it might be, military, trade school, et cetera. Um, there's, there's so many different options out there. Well, that was a mouthful. Um, I think that's about it. Uh, I just wanted to provide the contact information for our counseling team on this last slide. Um, and, and just wish everybody all the best of luck. It's a, it's a big process, it's a complex process, uh, and, and you have a lot of people in the counseling office and, and in other parts of the high school building who would do anything they possibly could to support you throughout the process. So please don't hesitate to reach out um, and, and let us know if you have questions or if there's any ways that we can support you.